congregation rises as you are able as we sing our gathering hymn for the morning number 705, God of Grace and God of Glory.
God, you are the source of life on the ground of our being by the power of your spirit. Bring healing to this wounded world and raise us to the new life of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The congregation may be seated. We invite all children, young and old, to come forward with the children. Greetings, my friends. How are you today? Good, good, good. I am super excited to see both of you because we have just enough people to play a slow motion version of a game today. Would you be willing to be part of a slow motion game today? Excellent. So the slow motion game I would like to play, and I say slow motion because I'm not very fast and I need us to all agree we're going to do this in slow motion, um, is to see if we could play a game of freeze tag. Do you know how freeze tag works? In case there are grown-ups who do not remember how freeze tag works, there is, as is often the case in tag, someone who is it, and their job is to tag the other people who are not it, right? Now, if you get tagged, you get frozen in place, and you can't move anymore unless, what happens? The unfreezer comes, it tags you, or goes through your life. That's right. So if somebody else comes and unfreezes you, then you are free to run again, right? So if we have a whole bunch of people play and tag, that would be a lot of people to be unfrozen. We've got just enough for all the roles here. Are either of you interested in being it? Would you be slow motion it? Okay. And Reagan, would you like to be the unfreezer? Okay, so this is going to be super easy for you because I'm super slow. So would you be willing to model for the congregation so you two can play at home with your friends and family? Slow motion, freeze tag. Okay, so I'm it and I'm walking away. Oh, please don't get me. I'm close. Oh, I'm frozen. I need help. Please, please, please don't freeze me. Oh, now I'm free to move again. Oh, now Brett's here. Brett, we're playing freeze tag. Join us. All right. We're playing slow motion freeze tag, which means if Maddie touches you, you're frozen. She's about to touch you. I know it. I can tell. <laughs> All right, so. And time out. All right, good. So we got it. Excellent. Everybody's good. Now. You've all seen how slow motion freeze tag works, or regular speed freeze tag. <laughs> now you know too, Reagan, that when your job is to unfreeze people, that means wherever they are, however they are, whatever pose they're in, your job is to help unfreeze them so they can be free again. You all can sit down for a minute, I know you just keep standing. I want to invite you to picture what we're doing as God's people. Every day is like we are all part of Jesus' work to unfreeze everybody who's frozen. It's almost like Jesus' work in the world is a giant game of worldwide freeze tag. And people who are frozen in place either with sadness or pain or sickness or sorrow or they feel like they've been left out, people feel frozen in place and stuck all the time. And Jesus has this way wherever he goes of helping bring people. Life. We're going to hear a story today where it's almost like Jesus is on a rampage of unfreezing people. There's this guy named Matthew that nobody else wants to hang out with because they don't like him and because he's a tax collector. And so Jesus says, come along, you be with me. He touches him and invites him to be a part of his group. And he's hanging out at his dinner party and the religious people are all scowling. We don't think you should be hanging out with those people. And Jesus said, nope, they're included too. Jesus even talks to the religious people and tells them, you're allowed to come and be a part of my group. And he finds somebody who's really, really sick. She's been sick for 12 years. That's longer than you've been alive. That's longer than you've been alive. That's longer than you've been alive. And Jesus heals her. And then there's a young girl who had died, and Jesus raises her back to life, even as she gets unfrozen, even from death. Jesus has this way. Wherever he goes, so whatever people's needs are, unfrozen, 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 unfrozen. And he invites us to be a part of that work, too. So when we run across somebody who's feeling really sad and left out, we could be the ones who bring Jesus love and say, you know what, I love you Jesus loves you. When we find somebody who's really, really sad and needs someone to cheer them up, we can be that person. Or there's somebody who needs a, a helping hand with something, we can be the ones to offer that. And the picture we're part of Jesus, giant, worldwide, unending game of freeze tag until everybody in all creation is unfrozen and all the powers of evil don't have the ability to freeze us anymore. Is that cool? So that means everywhere you go, whether the world knows it or not, they're playing a giant, worldwide game of freeze tag. And we're part of Jesus. Pretty big mission. I think we better pray for it too. Would you all join me too? Because you've also been conscripted in Jesus' worldwide unfreezing role. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, wherever we go, help us to be your hands and feet to bring other people more fully to life, where they've been frozen in place because they feel left out, or where their hearts are sad, or where they're dealing with sickness, or they just need a friend. Help us to be a part of your work to bring.
bring them more fully to life, to unfreeze them with the touch of your love, and help us to join everywhere we go in your work of bringing your love to everybody everywhere. We love you too, Jesus. Amen. Thank you so much for being a part of it and playing our game.
it will be reckoned to us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was handed over to death for our trespasses, and was raised for our justification. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <laughs>
signal as well. I was in a meeting earlier this week of a, a social service agency, and they were talking about how their lines follow the county lines, but how many of our communities don't exactly follow those lines. There's people who live just on the edge into Armstrong County, you're just on the edge in Jefferson County, and when they need help or something, sorry, you're just over the line of this agency, they can't help these people, sorry, that's out of our service area. We're used to things like that having, sorry, it's out of my service area, I can't help you. So many of the things in our lives we rely on have limits to where they cover. Maybe you found it as well, things like your health insurance. Sorry, it covers this doctor, but not that one. Or if I have a procedure done here at this hospital, I'll cover, but over there, I'm not. Even if it's something that's life-sustaining or necessary, we play these games of where will I be covered, and where will this thing that helps me to be healthy and well, where will it cover me, and where are their limits and boundaries? We are used to living in a world where the things that we rely on for help say, sorry, I can't go any further than this to help you. My care, my service just doesn't go there. I'm here to tell you today, Jesus reaches everywhere. And the stories we've been given today out of Matthew chapter 9 are instances of how even just in one day of Jesus' life, Jesus meets people at a whole various range of different needs and places, and there's no point there's no point where Jesus goes, sorry, this isn't my area. Sorry, you're out of my coverage area. Sorry, you don't qualify. Sorry, I can't help you. Whatever the need, wherever the place, Jesus reaches everywhere. No matter what the problem or the need. It's worth us hearing that. Especially in a time when it's easy to reduce Jesus. To, He's just a spiritual place. And Jesus says, nope. It begins with that story of Jesus walking along the road and finding this guy named Matthew who's a tax club, doing his job of collecting taxes. And just with two words, come, follow me, changing Matthew's life. Now, unspoken in the text, but everybody in the first century knows you don't want to hang out with those tax collectors. Not just because it's not fun to pay taxes. It's not just that people don't like giving their money. It's if you are a tax collector in the era and the time of the Roman Empire, your tax money is going to fund the empire that's occupying you, right? It's not just like I give my taxes with the thought that maybe they'll finally fill that pothole down my street that I really want them to take care of, or maybe this will go to my school, or there will be a new book in the library that I pay my taxes. It's this is money that the empire takes to then have more occupying army soldiers to harass your neighbors or crucify people down the street or um, put the people who you care about in harm's way. So if you're a tax collector in the first century, if you're Jewish and here's one of these guys working for the Romans, everybody sees you as a sellout. You, you've been a traitor to your own people, not just taking their money, not just maybe cheating them, but also the money that you've taken is going to help the empire that everybody sees as the enemy, as the problem, as the machine, as the oppressor. Jesus knows he is never not in the story he finds himself. Jesus knows all that baggage and says that doesn't stop me. You are included, Matthew, just as you are. And you'll notice there are no prerequisites. There's no Matthew, I'd like to invite you to be part of my club, but your job is just immoral and terrible. You're going to have to quit, learn a new trade, get a new career, and then six months later, after you've established yourself, then come back to me and be a part of my team. It's follow me. And with that, Matthew discovers Jesus' reach includes his, even while everybody else around will look down. And Jesus doubles down on this because the next thing we know, Jesus is at a dinner party with not just one Matthew, the tax collector, but a whole bunch of those tax collectors and the ones that everybody else looks down on as those sinners. The people who are viewed by the respectable religious people, not just as, well, they occasionally break a commandment or two. These are people who are seen to your very identity as your sinful, your wicked, your unacceptable, your whole lifestyle is bad and wrong and judged. You, the respectable religious people, have no room for that dinner party full of tax collectors. And there's Jesus sharing the table with them as if to say, I don't judge you. I accept you just as you are. In our day, again, we're used to eating with strangers all the time and not thinking much of it. You find yourself at a McDonald's and whoever happens to be in the booth next to you, you don't get to control what their story is or where they're coming from. But in the first century, in the ancient Near East, who you choose to eat with is a statement of, you are accepted by me. I accept you as you are. We are social equals. If I look down on you, I wouldn't dare share a table with you. And that's what frustrates the respectable religious people so much. 
that instead of looking down on these people having their dinner party and saying, I don't think you're acceptable, I wouldn't be caught dead with the likes of you. Jesus just finds himself surrounded by them and says, I accept you. I'll share a table with you. I'll break bread with you. I'm not afraid, and I choose you to be a part of what I'm about in the world. This is what the kingdom of God looks like to Jesus. It includes the ones that everybody else has written off as unacceptable and unworthy. Not just by their job, because once or twice they break a rule, but down to their very identity, everybody else judges them as unworthy, as wicked, as sinful. And Jesus goes, well, I don't. My youth includes you as well, without a word of condemnation, without a prerequisite. You've got to get your act together, and then I'll let you in. As you are. And then, amazingly, Jesus also turns to include the very self-righteous, respectable religious people who have been scolding the whole time, too. This is one of those things I love about this one, and it pokes at me, too. And maybe if we hear it, it will poke at us as well. While Jesus is there at the dinner party, hanging out with all people who nobody else will associate with because they aren't respectable religious people, the respectable religious people won't even venture their criticism at Jesus. They start aiming at his disciples. Hey, disciples of Jesus! They're too afraid to talk to Jesus directly. Why does your teacher hang out with, you know, those people? They're standing outside the celebration with their little protest sign. Not protest, but this is happening. And Jesus overhears them. And instead of going, that's it, you guys are too close-minded, you can't be a part of my team either. He talks back to them and says, don't you get it? This is what God's been after all along. Go and learn what this means, he says, quoting those words we heard from Hosea. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. You've been so focused on being observant of rule followers, you've missed the point of God's kingdom is to include people who feel lost, who've been told they are unworthy and too far gone, whose lives are so much of a mess they don't know how to start over again. Of course, that's exactly what the kingdom of God should be. You are invited to be a part of it, you respectable religious people, but you're going to have to understand you don't get to be gatekeepers anymore. I'm inviting you to be a part of it, but the party's going to be around all the people you don't think are worthy. Go learn what this is. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. But Jesus reaches even up to the pedestal the self-righteous, respectable people have put themselves on as well. They're invited to the party. They just got to be aware. The guest list is awfully wide and deep. From there, this seems to be a very, very busy day that Jesus is having. While he's talking to these respectable religious people, one of them, the leader of the synagogue, so that's another one of the respectable religious people, maybe one of the very ones who been scolded of Jesus a minute ago, gets for his young daughter back home and die. When um, Mark tells the story, he says the girl's about 12 years old. And says to Jesus, I need you to come and help. So even though this is one of the same people who's been criticizing Jesus a moment ago, now he needs your help. He's desperate. And Jesus, without this, all right, run, let's go. He brings his disciples along. And while he's on the way, somebody else emerges from the crowd who's been sick, bleeding for 12 years. For as long as the synagogue leader's daughter has been alive, she's been sick with uncurable bleeding. And she reaches out to touch edge of Jesus' cloak, in the hope that maybe she won't make too much fuss, maybe it won't make too much notice, she doesn't hope for a quiet miracle, because she knows what everybody else knows, this unscary, <laughs> invisible, but very real barrier. You don't touch somebody who you are not related to, especially men to women, women to men in public in the ancient Near East. You certainly don't do that if you are ceremonially unclean because you have a blood disorder. She's breaking a whole bunch of very, very important, respectable religious rules by reaching out to touch Jesus. Jesus is well aware of what Jesus is not naive in the story he finds himself in. So he realizes not only that when she's touched him, what's happened, but she realizes if he doesn't do something, everybody's going to be mad at her when he leaves the scene and goes to the next adventure. So he turns to her, and as if to say to everybody else, don't you worry, daughter. It's okay. I'm not pressing charges. Nobody's mad at you. You're fine. This is okay. So Jesus is not upset. Like, you broke rule. Don't you know? You're not allowed to touch somebody who's not related to you. Don't you know? If you're ceremonially unclean, you touch somebody else, they become unclean. Jesus doesn't care about any of those things. I'm, I'm not upset. This is fine. It's okay. Nobody else in the room, you don't attack her. It's okay. And then proceeds on to one uncrossable barrier. Death itself. Up to this point, as Jesus has crossed barriers, they've all been basically human constructs, social boundaries and barriers, right? There are these unspoken rules. You don't hang out with those tax collectors. There are these unspoken rules. You don't hang out with those sinful people. There are unspoken ceremonial rules. You don't touch somebody who's ceremonially unclean. But here 
here, Jesus comes right up to the threshold of death itself. It's the barrier that I don't have power on my own cross, but Jesus does. Calls out to her, takes her by the hand, and Jesus' love reaches even into the realm of death and restores her back to life. Jesus reaches everywhere. And notice how in the course of, I don't know, one afternoon, one evening, all of these scenes and stories, how many different ways Jesus has brought people back to life. How many different ways, as you said to the children, Jesus has unfrozen people who are stuck in different poses of frozenness. Matthew, who feels stuck in a dead end because he doesn't know any other job to have, and when he has, makes everybody else hate him. Or the whole gavel of tax collectors and quote-unquote sinners that nobody else wants to associate with, even the respectable religious people. The woman who's bleeding, the young woman who was dead, each of these need, whatever they are, whether it's death to life, healing for sickness, welcome for the outcast, or maybe uh, clarification and course correction for the respectful religious people. Jesus meets them all. Jesus reaches everywhere. It is fashionable sometimes for church folk, for respectable religious people in our day and time to say church folk should only be concerned with spiritual things. That's all Jesus came for. The gospel is how do you get people to get in heaven by doing the right thing, saying the right words, praying the right prayers, they get to heaven. That's all our mission is that's it. Jesus never thinks that. Jesus is convinced his work is to bring people more fully to life. To unfreeze people's stuff is a world game of freeze tag and bring everybody, everywhere more fully to life. Whatever the boundaries are that are there to be crossed, whatever thing has kept them from being brought fully to life, Jesus says, that's my business. And, mind you, at every turn, Jesus has brought his community of followers to watch what he's doing. So they're there, as he calls man. They're there in the house at the party with all the tax collectors and sinners. They're there as Jesus confronts the self-righteous, respectable people up on a high horse. They're there as Jesus heals the woman. They're there outside the house as Jesus restores a young girl back to life. They've seen it as if Jesus is trying to say, this is how big and how wide and how deep my mission is. Wherever you find yourself, my love reaches you there. That's the work you and I get to be a part. And let's be clear about this too. Jesus is going to do what he's going to do in the world, with or without us. The question is whether he has to work in spite of us or with us alone. Jesus is going to continue in this world, finding the folks who feel like they're outcasts and saying, I choose you. You are welcome. Jesus is going to find the people everybody else are respectable because this crowd is scoffing at this morning and saying, I accept you. I welcome you. Let me come to your party and celebrate. Jesus is going to keep finding the respectable religious people who think they know better than God, who's includable, and telling them, I want you at the party too. But you got to include the rest of the guest list. He's going to be there bringing healing to people who are sick and even bringing life where there is death. The only question is whether we will be a part of that work or whether he's going to work in spite of that. I don't know where this day finds you or where in the story maybe you find yourself. It's possible you've been each one of these places before. Sometimes you've been all of them at once before. My guess is at some point in your life, you know what it feels like to be the one nobody else wants to hang out with. You know what it feels like to be alone and feel like everybody else has cut off from you. You've been in Matthew's sandals before. Maybe you've been there when everybody else judges you as unworthy, unacceptable, or someone you love has been judged as unworthy and unacceptable. And to hear Jesus but I choose you, and I sit at the party with you, and I welcome you as you are his life-giving good news. Maybe you found yourself, I will confess, I find myself more awful than I would like to be there in the role of self-righteous, respectable person, judging all the other people I don't think measure up. And Jesus comes and meets me and goes, hey, how about you take down a step off your head? Come to the party, there's a place for you at the table where you have been the one who was hurting and needed healing, where something felt like it's dead inside you and needed to be brought to life. My guess is you been maybe in all of those places at some point or another, maybe all at once, Jesus meets you there. Without precondition or prerequisite, and without saying, sorry, you're out of my coverage area. Get your life together, and then you can reapply. Or, sorry, that's a job for somebody else. No, Jesus meets us where we are with what we have. Which is why our calling, when we go from this place, is to meet people wherever they are. Jesus' love reaches you to right where you are. So that's why, today with your bullet, you 
you've got one of these little teeny tiny versions of the picture that's out in the social hall with each of these little scenes to remember what we heard about today. And then I realize it's hard to share this little tiny picture. It's only like two inches by four inches of the rest of the world. But the rest of the world is going to need that love that needs them wherever they are. You're going to have to bring it in a bigger size, maybe even, I don't know, life size. Maybe it's not just, I need to hand this picture to other people. How will you be the picture? Who will be the people that you cross paths with this week who are stuck in Matthew's spot and feel like nobody wants to hang out with them and for whatever reason they can't find a way to get connected? How will you be the one to say, of course, Jesus' love reaches them, so I might be the conduit to say, you are worthy and chosen and love come along. Where other people that you know are being sworn and scoffed at by the respectable religious people of the 21st century, you might be the one who finds yourself at a table with them and say, you are accepted, you are beloved the same way Jesus does as well. Maybe when you find yourself or others around as that self-righteous, respectable religious voice, when you catch me being that, you might be called to be the one to smack me upside the head in love and go, I think that's not how this works, preacher. When you find other people who are hurting, you might be the one who brings Jesus' love to them, who brings healing. When you run across the path of somebody who feels like there's something dead inside them, you might be the one who speaks to the word that calls them back to life. So the little small version is for you to remember what Jesus is up to with or without us. The challenge when we leave this place is not to make a whole bunch of little copies of this for everybody else, but for you to be the living embodiment of the way Jesus reaches for whatever ways you felt Jesus reach into your life and bring you more fully to life, when you felt you were frozen in place with something and Jesus came and touched you and brought you back to life, that's what we are aiming at. That's how Jesus' worldwide name of freeze tag goes out everywhere in every direction. So everybody we cross paths with will know it's true. Jesus reaches everywhere. together the hymn of the day number 612 healer of our every ill 612 
God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Trusting in God's abundant mercy, let us offer our prayers for the world in need. We pray, O oh God, for the church. Unite us with any on the margins that the whole world recognizes that your mercy is greater than our human capacity to restrict it. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We pray, O oh God, for creation. Tend forests and fields and safeguard all cattle, birds, and wild animals. Preserve lakes, rivers, and oceans, and send rains to water the earth. Revive lands recovering from natural disasters. Lord, in your mercy, we hear our prayers. We pray, O oh God, for the nations. Awaken in our leaders compassion for people who have too often felt forgotten or neglected, and inspire policy solutions that promote equity and inclusion. Lord, in your mercy, we hear our prayers. We pray, O oh God, for all who are in need. Accompany anyone enduring chronic illness, any who suffer in secret, and those grieving a loved one's death. Send healing for all who plead for relief from sickness or pain. Today especially, we lift up Joel and Lois, Dave Johnston, Corinne Craig's family, Cindy and Sylvia Bottle, and all those we now name in our hearts or upon our lives. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We pray, O oh God, for the eradication of racial hatred. On this week, when we commemorate the Emmanuel Nine, we implore you to cast out the demons of white supremacy that make us believe lies about ourselves and our neighbors. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We give thanks, O oh God, for Barnabas and all the saints. Renew our faith that you can do what you have promised and raise us with all our beloved dead to new life. God, in your mercy, we hear our right prayers. Receive our prayers and answer us, O oh God, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. You're invited to share a sign of Christ's peace with one another before we sing the offer.
Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, the church on earth, and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. <laughs>
We sing as our sending hymn, number 697, Just a Closer Walk. 